and my name is Terrence McNamara. I'm the Equipment Division and Asset Manager for C.C. Myers, Inc., and I'm here to represent the AGC of California. We are Caltrans contractors, and like you, we are affected by the January 2013 implementation of the 2010 standard specifications and the periodic revisions to the standard specifications. The training webinar you are attending is intended to make you more familiar with the 2010 Caltrans standard specifications in both preparing your bids, sub-bids, and materials quotes, and in performing work under it. It is an outgrowth and expansion on the training done in District 2 last February in response to an AGC construction industry and Caltrans district liaison where the specifications were used on a local assistance project and illustrated some major changes in some of the relations between the parties and what is included in the bid items. Caltrans' response to requests for additional training prompted Malcolm Doherty, Caltrans Director, to create a task group of Caltrans and industry personnel to review the standards and develop this training session. The task group was attended by Caltrans, individual contractors, the AGC of California, California Asphalt Pavement Association, and California Construction Industrial Materials Association. Today's session, which is being recorded for future attendees, will be available via the Caltrans website and will begin with why the 2010 specifications were written. What is known as plain language is a departure from past editions, so a brief review of the style guide is included to assist in understanding the new standards, whether as the owner, Caltrans or the local agency, or you as the contractor, subcontractor, or supplier. This will be followed by some examples and specific changes made by the 2010 standard specifications, the periodic revisions to standard specification, or RSSs, and correspondingly the standard special provisions, SSPs, used or modified by each contract. Included in this presentation will be that any item of work shown, including any costs associated with the permits, licenses, and certifications of each project, but not provided with a bid item on the bid itself are incidental to other items listed of work and included in the total bid. The 2010 specification experts serving as presenters today are Jill Sewell from the Caltrans Division of Engineering Services, Office of Engineer, Office of Construction Contract Standards, who will address why the 2010 construction contract standards and a, a brief review of the style guide for 2010 specifications. Also, Ruth Fernandez, Caltrans Division of Engineering Services Structures, Specifications, Research and Development Branch, and she will address the review of the 2010 standard specifications and associated special provisions. And Chuck Sesco, Caltrans Division of Construction, Office of Construction Engineering, who will address using the 2010 standard specifications, followed by a question and answer period. Although this will not be an all-encompassing training on all aspects of the 2010 specification, it is intended to inform you of some of the more basic provisions to help avoid the disputes and potential claims that could result from misinterpretation of the specification. Your attendance today is certainly appreciated in assisting both Caltrans and industry to implement the 2010. So let's begin, and I'll turn this over to Jill Sewell. Thank you, Terrence. Um, like he introduced me, I am the office chief in construction contract standards. So my office maintains and develops with the department's subject matter experts the standard specs, special provisions, and standard plans. My portion of the training will include why the 2010 construction contract standards and a brief review of the style guide for the 2010 specifications. Why were the 2010 specifications rewritten? Well, first, it was time. The department standard specifications are typically published every three to five years. Our previous editions include 1975, 78, 81, 84, 88, 92, 95, 99, 2006, and our current edition of 2010. The number of SSPs used on every project has grown, and that's why many of them have been moved into the 2010 standard specifications. 
And three, the 2006 amendments needed to be incorporated into the 2010 standard specifications. The amendment had grown to over 300 pages. Four, reduce project-specific editing. Five, conform to various government plain language requirements. Six, standardize payment in lieu of repetitive payment clauses. Seven, move standard plan notes, which were actually specifications, to the 2010 standard specifications. And eight, standardize numbering of the bid items and special provisions to match the 2010 standard specifications. This concept can be appreciated by all. So why did we want to um, rewrite the 2010 specifications? California Government Code Section 6219 required the government write in plain, straightforward language. And June 1st, 1998, Presidential Executive Order, over 15 years ago, required agencies to write in plain language. The department wanted to comply with the California Government Code and the Pres Presidential Executive Order. Moving on to the review of the style guide for the 2010 specifications. The style guide sets the style, language, format, and organization of the specifications. The style guide is posted on the Office Engineer website, shown at the link below. When you click on the link, you'll go to our webpage. In the right-hand corner, you'll see in the red circle, Guidance. Once you click on the Guidance, you'll go to another page where the second of the list shows the 2010-2015 specification style guide. The plain language conversion includes one, writing in active voice and imperative mood. Verbs in active voice so the sh show the subject acting. Active voice uses strong verbs that make sentences clear and complete. The order of active voice is direct, subject, verb, object. The subject takes action, the verb describes the action, and the object receives the action. Imperative mood expresses commands or requests with you as the subject. Imperative mood makes commands, direct requests, and requires verbs that clearly define action. An example would be, take out the garbage. Another example would be, the form must be signed and returned by 4 p.m. today. Item two, using must instead of shall. Item three, writing positively. Item four, writing short sentences and paragraphs. Item five, using lists. Item six, converting specification sections to a four-part format. Here are some plain language terms. Under replaces in conformance with. You may replaces the contractor may. Authorize replaces approve. Shown replaces shown on plan. Must comply replaces shall conform. Note that section five expressions in the style guide for more items. Plain language lists. Replacing words with lists increase understanding. An example is shown in section 5-102. The next slide will show the list. On the right-hand side, you see the 2006 standard specifications. On the left-hand side, you see the 2010 standard specifications. The left-hand side is the plain language translation of what was written in the 2006 specifications. The colors are coded to match the translation. The style guide describes the organization of the specifications. The organization is used in sections 15 through 99. 
This is a four-part format that I previously mentioned. Notice the numbering and see one is general, two is materials, three is construction, and four is payment. Each heading has a summary of what the section is to include. Note, a general section applies to all other sections at the same and lower levels. Any payment specifications under the payment will contain measurement clauses that are specific to the applicable work. Standard subsections in the general section. The alpha characters with summary, definition, submittal, quality control and assurance may be subsections under the general section and they are not required. Reserved and not used. From the 2010 standard specifications, you can see on pages one and two, headings are included for the purpose of organization and referencing. Inclusion of a heading with no related content, not used or reserved, does not indicate that no specification exists for that subject. Applicable specifications may be covered in a general or reference specification. Sections are reserved in the standard specifications for correlation of special provisions and revised standard specifications with the standard specifications and for future expansion of the standard specifications. So here's a little background on the concept of using reserved and not used. It came from master spec, which is our building specification. The example from the 2010 standards in 8-104C, delayed start, shows reserved. You can find that on page 104 of the standard specification. Delayed start is a reserved section in the standard specification. When the delayed start requirements are needed, the special provisions will include 8104C that adds the delayed start requirements. Reserved is used to create placeholders in the standard specifications for any special provisions that may be needed in the section. As for 12-3.01B materials, materials is the second part of a four-part format general materials construction and payment. This section does not have any material requirements, but we want to keep the four-part format for continuity. In the SSP example for section 52-4, stainless steel bar reinforcement, not used is described in the special provision let me back up, I'm sorry. Um, 52-4 stainless steel bar reinforcement is a heading in the standard specification. It is currently reserved. From the special provision, you will see replacing the reserved in 52-4 with the following requirements. Within those special provisions, under construction and under payment, you see not used. Not used is described in the special provisions when there are no requirements for the four-part section. If it is not specified, the numbering would not be sequential, and again, it's a continuity issue. Here is a diagram of section headings within a heading. Requirements in a general heading apply to all the sections in that level and below. So the requirements in 49-1 general apply to 49-2, 49-3, etc. The requirements in general section 49-2.01 apply to subsections 49-2.02, 49-2.03, and 49-2.04. Think of this as an umbrella. Based on the 2006s, the 2010s are nearly the same. 
Items of work are nearly the same. Standard plan drawings are nearly the same. Notes that are actually specifications were moved in the specifications in the book or as special, special provisions. Notice to bidders is nearly the same. The number of federal trainees and plant establishment days are listed there instead of the special provisions as previously in projects using 2006 standards. How are the 2010s the same? The bid book is nearly the same. However, a bidder acknowledgement has been added clarifying permits, licenses, agreements, and certifications, otherwise known as plaques, and railroad relations. They are all part of a contract. To continue how the 2010s are different, the 2010 standard specifications are periodically modified by revised standard specifications, otherwise known as RSS. The special provisions, SPs, may modify both the latest RSS and the 2010 standard specifications. The special provisions may replace, add, or delete a word, sentence, paragraph or section in either the RSS 2010 standard specifications or both. Special provisions are shorter, have new numbers that match the RSS and the 2010 standard specifications for continuity. The first two numbers of a bid item refer to the applicable section number. Old non-uniform numbering system of the special provisions, for example, 10-1.05 is not used. There are also new sections in the 2010, section 21 being erosion control. Here is section 8-104 in the standard specifications shown on page 104. Start of job site activities. The RSS and the special provisions refer to the section numbers in the standard specification. This helps in knowing specifically where changes are being made. The revised standard specification RSS number the introduction says to replace the first, the last paragraph of section 8104B with the following requirements. In the special provisions, the section number replaces the reserved in section 8104C with the following requirements. On this slide, you can see what the changes look like if they were incorporated. The, spe the specifications are in black text, the RSS in blue text, and the special provisions in red text. Using the same section number allows us to see exactly where the changes are being made. To continue how the 2010s are different, since publication, new sections of the 2010 standard specifications have been added by the revised standard specifications. They include Section 30, Reclaim Pavements, Section 36, General, which includes general requirements applicable to pavements, and Section 78, Incidental Construction. A few more differences. There is no longer a Section 13 for railroad clauses. See 2010 Standard Specifications and RSS Section 5-120, Coordination with Other Entities, Section 5-120C, Railroad Relations, on page 39. You can see that in the standards, 5-120C, Railroad Relations, is currently reserved. And in the RSS, Section 5120C is modified by an RSS. 
it replaces requirements in the reserved with the following. More differences in the 2010s. Here, an here is an example of intro the introductory sentence to Section 52 reinforcement. On the left-hand side, you'll see the 2010 standard specifications. And on the right-hand side, you see the 2010 standard specifications for the introduction of Section 52 reinforcement. More things on how the 2010s are different. The 2006 standards measurement and payment clauses were in every section. The 2010 standards payment is described in section 9 of the 2010 standard specifications and is not repeated. Gone is the repetition of full compensation for furnishing all labor, materials, tools, equipment, and incidentals for doing all the work involved in the appropriate item. So the first two digits of your bid item code evoke the standard specification section. Be reminded that work is defined in section one of the 2010 standard specifications. Here's an example of a measurement clause in the 2006 standard specifications. Measurement for payment is now in section nine and you will not see the old measurement and payment clauses as in the clearing and grubbing example. Here's an example of a payment clause in the 2006 standard specifications for clearing and grubbing. In the 2010 standard specifications, the payment section is used when there are special instructions on how to measure work for payment. Here is an example of payment for clearing and grubbing from the 2010 standard specifications. Notice under payment, it is not used. Measurement and payment is described in section nine. Not used means there are no special instructions on how to measure the work. We'll talk about the specifics in a few minutes. More information about payment will be discussed later. Here is an example of a notice to bidders and special provision. This is a cover of an, a previous contract. Here's a table of contents that you would see within the book. And notice that the revised standard specifications are in the book. They are the last item referenced in the book in the table of contents. This concludes my portion of the training. The next segment of the training will be done by Ruth Fernandez. Hi, this is Ruth Fernandez, and I'm with the Caltrans Structure Specifications Research and Development Branch. And I will be going over, um, or doing a review of the 2010 standard specifications and associated SFPs. I'll be going chronologically um, through the book, hit it, highlighting different sections and divisions. Um, I'll especially talk about new divisions and new sections. Okay, for divisions, we've always had divisions in our um, standard specifications. You've just probably never noticed them. We've never really addressed them in our specs. But um, if you look on, if you have your red standard spec book, if you look on page I, you'll see um, the divisions listed with the um, table of contents. And um, the new divisions we have are a general construction division, division two. Uh, we have a drainage division, miscellaneous construction, traffic control facilities, and a building construction division. Okay, just starting off at the very beginning of the book, on page one, um, division one includes general specifications applicable to every contract unless specified as applicable un under certain conditions. And division one is sections one through nine. So everything in section one, 
one through nine applies to every contract. Also on that same page one, um, we have another thing. This is part of our payment. Um, the bid item set forth the construction specifications that apply. The first two digits of a bid item code correspond to the specification section number with the same two first digits, except for bid item code 99990 that corresponds to section nine. And that unless otherwise unless shown otherwise in the table titled bid items and applicable sections in the special provision. So it's really important to understand that the bid items set forth the sections that apply. That's what this is saying. So if we go ahead and look at um, special provision 1-1.01, uh, this is where we put, um, we have some non-standard bid items, for example, section or um, 78 inch permanent steel casing. This is a non-standard item. So the bid item code, the 043551, it doesn't match up with section 49. So here we put the applicable section. Similarly, for the 30 inch welded steel pipe casing, it's um, section 70. Okay, also from page one, we have paragraph 13. And this is where a location is not specified with words shown, specified, or described. Shown means shown on the plan. Specified means specified in the specifications. Described means described in the contract. And described may mean shown, specified, or both. So when you go through your specs, you're not going to see shown on the plans or specified in the specifications. So if you see something shown, you know it's shown on the plan. Okay, for um, page two of the same section, 1-101, par paragraph 18, all items in a list apply unless the items are specified as choices. We used to, in our specification, sometimes add an and or an or within the list. Those are no longer there, so everything applies. And here's a couple of examples. Um, for example, we re repair or replace a temporary cover when any of the following occur. So that is, you can pick one of them, it's specified as a choice. The other one, the second example is, um, it all applies, so both one and two do apply. Okay, continuing on on page two, section 1-105, paragraph three, a reference to a section includes the general specifications for the section. Jill Sewell also covered this, but this shows, you know, for piling, all, the general section applies to all the subsections. On page four of section 1-106, uh, we show all the abbreviations. And just as a note, the 2010 standard specification abbreviations do not match up with the standard plan. So if you're using a standard plan, you have to check the, the standard plan abbreviations at the beginning of the standard plan book. Okay, in section 1-107 definitions, we have some new definitions. Um, so Generally, we use the term activity, and that replaces operations. Department means Department of Transportation. So if you see department in your specs, it'll mean Department of Transportation. Dispose of means removed from the job site. Highway is the highway right-of-way. State means State of California. And work is the resources and activities required for contract acceptance, including labor, materials, equipment, and the created product. So if you notice the labor, materials, equipment, and created product, that's um, part of what is included in the work. Okay, um, in section 1-109, we have free saw areas. And free saw areas are areas of the state where free saw cycles and heavy salting frequently occur. A project is in a free saw area if the project is specified in the specifications or special provisions to be in the free saw area. And note, this is an example of conditional phrasing. So if you go ahead and if you were to um, see a special provision in your project and it says this project is in a free saw area, then from section 90, you would see for concrete in a free saw area, you know, section 90-1.02i applies to concrete for projects specified in the special provision to be in a free saw area. So all the specifications within that section apply um, for the project. Um, section two is where we keep our supplemental project information. 
Um, it's on page 17. And we have a special provision where we list the supplemental project information. And it's pretty much the same as it was in the 2006 standards, but it now has a place in the standard specification. Okay, section 4-105 changes and extra work. In the 2006 standards, it was just section 4-1.03, the extra work. So there's a little bit of change. And extra work is now called change order work. For example, uh, modifying the existing deck surface or deck smoothness is change order work. And we no longer will reference sections 1 through 9 because 1 through 9 always apply. And the, the term change order work, you'll see within um, the construction section, typically it won't be in the payment section. Um, section 4-1.06, differing site conditions, it used to be in section 5 of the 2000 standard specifications, but now it's been moved to section 4. Okay, for the 2010 standard specifications, in section 5, um, we changed the, the hierarchy or the ranking of the different parts. So if you notice um, where the little star is, uh, standard plans are now in a lower ranking than the standard specifications. So that did change, and we had to go through and make sure if we had standard plans that were relying on hierarchy, um, we had to make sure to write our specifications correctly so that the standard specifications wouldn't accidentally override our standard plan. So that that ranking was changed, that's something you really need to note. A section 5-1.20B permits, license agreements, and and certificates, we call those plaques. So you have to always comply with the plaques, and um, the contract states the plaques must be followed. And payment to comply with plaques is in section 9-1.03, paragraph 1. Uh, Jill went over this already, but we no longer have a section 13. It's now in section 5-1.20C, Railroad Relations. And really, that just states by RSS that you're going to see your um, railroad agreements and railroad relations stuff in the special provisions. Oh, not in the special provisions, but in the information handout. And here's showing um, like a typical cover sheet for the information handout with railroad relations shown. Um, okay, now we have a new submittal section, 5-1.23, and this gives all the general submittal requirements. And to start off, Section 5-1.23 includes specifications for action and informational submittals. Any submittal not specified as an informational submittal is an action submittal. And the term action means that when you submit it, there is an action required by the department. So either we have to authorize it, you know, accept it, or reject it. Okay, um, submit action and informational submittals to the engineer. And then we have other requirements, um, you know, that falls within that section. The default review time for a submittal is 15 days. Working drawings are now called shop drawings and have a default review time of 20 days. And that's on page 40. Uh, also, we include um, informational submittals. So these are something that we would just um, accept. They can be rejected if they have an error or omission. But so we don't have to repeat that this is an informational submittal throughout our standard specs. We have um, listed ones that are um, standard informational submittals, and these include assignments, certificates of compliance, manufacturer's instructions, notifications, plaques, and subcontracts. Okay, section nine, payment scope. Payment is full compensation for all work. I have it underlined, and I also showed you the definition for work earlier, um, involved in each bid item shown on the bid item list by the unit of measure shown for that bid item. And payment also is for the price bid for each bid item shown on the bid item list or is changed by change order with a specified price adjustment. So that's what payment is. So the big change is for the 2010, the bid items are the contract pay clauses. For example, um, the bid item 510053, it sets forth section 51 because the bid item sets forth the specifications that apply. So section 51 describes the work. So that is a um, structural concrete bridge and the unit of measure is cubic yard. 
Continuing with Section 9, we have full compensation for work specified in Divisions 1, 2, and 10 is included in the payment for the bid item unless bid item for the work is shown on the bid item list or work is specified as change order work. So payment for a bid and payment for a bid item includes payment for work in sections referenced by by the section set forth by that bid item. It's kind of wordy, but it actually um, is pretty important. So if you go to if we go ahead and look at structural concrete bridge again, you know the number the bid item number is 510053. It sets forth section 51 and it. In Section 51, it says false work must comply with Section 48-2. In the 2010 standard specifications, we moved all the temporary structure requirements to Section 48. So in Section 51, we just reference 48, 48, and all the requirements of 48 for false work are included in the bid item price for structural concrete bridge. And here's just um, an RSS showing. Um, we added some additional things in this RSS. So if you can see, you know, earthwork for the following concrete structures must comply with 19-3. So all these in the list, the earthworks included in the work. So before we used to just full comp, this, you know, everything in the payment section. Now we actually reference the work that's included. And you can see underneath that, false work must comply with section 48-2. Okay, and here's a payment example. So in the standard specification, section 80-1 fence general, okay, 80-1.10 payment, um, the fence payment quantity does not include the width of the openings, and the fence is measured parallel to the ground slope along the fence. So for all fences, this is the general pay cost because it's in the um, general section. We go and look at the um, chain link fences, section 80-3, we have a not used. So there's nothing different from what's in the general section. Then, as another look, we're going to look at the RSS, and there's no change to 80-1.10 or 80-3.304. And then looking at the special provisions, there's no changes to either one of those either. So for chain link fences, um, the general provisions or the general section um, applies. Okay, going back to section 9. Partial pay, so we've always listed materials on hand that that is now has a location in section nine. And so you'll see, um, like in the special provisions, you'll see add to section 9-1.16C, the following items are eligible for progress payment even if they are not incorporated into the work. So this is um, typically how we've always done it. It just now has a home in the standard specification. Okay, now we have Division 2, General Construction. Division 2 includes specifications for general construction applicable to every contract unless specified as applicable under certain conditions. So that means everything in sections um, 10 through 15 apply to every project. Section 10 is a general construction section. It's called general. It's a new section. We also have another new section, Quality Control and Assurance. Um, section 12 is, we've always had a Section 12, but now it's called Temporary Traffic Control. Section 13 is Water Pollution Control. Section 14 is Environmental Stewardship. And Section 15 is Existing Facilities. And I'm going to go ahead and go through um, a little bit on each one of these. Okay, for Section 10, it's a new section for general construction work. Um, it includes work sequencing requirements, time constraints, sustainable design. And work sequencing and time constraints are the new order of work sections. Please note that work sequencing and time constraints may be also found in other sections. For example, if you had some work sequencing doing, dealing with just piling and nothing else, those constraints would be within the piling section. So typically, these constraints are something that would apply to many sections, would be put in section 10. Okay, and we also, within the um, revised standard specifications, we've added um, some headings and some general specifications for Section 10. So we have Section 10 includes general specifications for general construction work. We have the work sequencing, and we also have a reserve section for time constraints. And from the special provisions, um, in here is where we've put any um, constraints, for example, 
you know, no construction activities allowed from post mile blank to post mile blank from to blank, whatever. This is, <laughs> sorry, guys, but this is where we would put, like, if you had migratory birds or something, it would go here. It applies to many sections of that standard specification. Section 11 is quality control and assurance. Um, it used to contain the Section 8 material, or it contains the Section 8 materials of the 2010, 2006 special provisions. So we also have quality control manager specifications. We included the precast concrete quality control originally in the 2010 standard specification, but in the recent RSS, we moved to moved it to Section 90-4. It also contains welding quality control, Section 13 water pollution control. Um, it used to be in Section 10, Construction Details. It's now in Section 13. It also includes the um, WPCP, the SWEEP, Job Site Management, Sediment Control, and et cetera, those types of specifications. Section 14, Environmental Stewardship. These specifications used to be in Sections 5 and 10 of the 2006 special provisions, now included in Section 14. Um, it has a wide range of environmental topics, ESA, hazardous waste, cultural resources. Division 3 grading. Divisions 3 through 9 include construction specifications. Wait, that doesn't work, but okay, Division 3 is grading, and then just generally Divisions 3 through 9 include construction specifications for specific bid items. So we'll start with grading, Division 3, and we have Section 20 landscape. It's a new name. It used to be called Erosion Control and Highway Planting. And now we have a new section, Section 21, Erosion Control. Erosion Control was removed from Highway Planting into its own section. Okay, Division 4, Sub-Bases and Bases. We have um, a new section, Section 30, Reclaimed Pavements. I believe Jill um, showed that in her presentation. The other two just have new names. Stabilized soils used to be line stabilization. Concrete bases used to be lean concrete base. Division 5 is surfacing and pavements. There's a new general section. It has general requirements for constructing surfacings and pavements. And um, Section 41 is concrete pavement repair. It's a new name. It used to be pavement, sub ceiling, and jack. Division 6, Structures. Uh, we have several new sections in this division. Um, section 46, Ground Anchors and Soil Nails. It's a new section. They used to just be special provisions. Section 47, Earth Retaining Systems. It's a new section. Um, it used to be special provisions. Section 48, Temporary Structures. This is where false works now located. We also have temporary supports and temporary shoring, different things in there. Section 57, Wood and Plastic Lumber Structures. It's a new name, but what we did is we added in the, the treated timber requirements from Section 58. We gained a new section, which we now have for sound walls. So Section 58 has all the sound wall requirements. Division 7 is drainage. Um, 63 is a reserve section now. It used to be cast in place concrete pipe. Section 67 has a new name. It used to be structural metal plate pipe. Division 8, Miscellaneous Construction. It now has some new sections, Section 76, Well, so all our well requirements are in this section. Section 77, Local Infrastructure, it's a new section. This is where we keep or place all the um, local requirements, maybe for city lighting or local waterway. Um, this would go in Local Infrastructure. Section 78, Incidental Construction, it's a new section that we put in through RS, an RSS. I like to think of it as kind of the junk drawer. Um, maybe that's not quite the right thing to say, but it's where we put things that are not closely associated with um, other sections. Division 9, Traffic Control Facilities. Uh, Section 86 is Electrical Systems. It's a new name. Division 10 is Materials. Division 10 includes specifications for common materials. For material specified in this division, that material specified in any section must comply with the specifications in Division 10. And what this means is when we talk about concrete through all the different sections, we're not going to say concrete must comply with Section 90. 
we have a concrete section, section 90. So it's um, every, every time we mention concrete, it goes to section 90. If we say minor concrete, it goes to section 90. So um, section 90 is our concrete specification. We also have a new section, 87, materials general. And we added this to include some um, general um, material requirements that you see in section 8. Section um, 88 is geosynthetics. It's a new name. It used to be filter fabric. And then 96 through 98 are reserved. And um, lastly, we have Division 11, building construction. Division 11 includes construction specifications for buildings. Um, building construction is all um, SFP. The formatting is currently being revised to match the CSI format used by industry for building construction. So um, when you have a building project, everything's going to be special provisions, and we're trying to make it look as much as possible, even the style like um, it is in the you know, private industry. And we're, we're changing to the CSI format. So I'm going to show you the current format um, that we use. So it looks like pretty much the rest of our standard specifications. But then if you go to um, the CSI format, example, and this is what we are moving to. It's more of a layout type of format, and it's fault we try and closely follow CSI. And if you notice, um, in this we have action submittals and informational submittals. So we didn't make those up. It's actually something that CSI has already been doing, and we saw it and we liked it, so we added it for all the specifications. Um, so anyway, so we weren't, yeah, we weren't making anything up. And um, next will be, this finishes my portion of the presentation. Next, Chuck Susco will be um, going over using the 2010 standard specification. Good morning, everyone. I'll be covering the two topics that should help you in using the 2010 standards. When using the specifications, you need to know how to replace, add, or delete words, and how to count paragraphs to properly combine the 2010 standard specification, the revised standard specs, and the special provisions. We're going to begin this morning with RAD, replace, add, and delete. The 2010 standard specifications contain Caltrans standards. Changes to the standard specifications are in our revised standard specifications, which are included in every project at the end of the special provisions. The revised standard special provisions, standard specifications, commonly referred to as the RSSs, Replace the old amended to reads that we used to have in the 2006 standard specifications. The revised standard specifications are typically updated quarterly, but more frequent updates are made if necessary. When a standard specification must be changed or updated because of revision, we now use an introductory clause that includes the replace, add, or delete for every change. We will refer to this as the RAD method. In the development of specifications, the specification writer must now make a determination to either replace the specification language, add specification language, or delete specification language every time a specification is changed. This method of modifying the standard specs makes it clear when a change within the standard specification is made and eliminates what we used to have in the past of conflicts between the standard specifications the amended to read and special provisions because it wasn't clear what was being changed or modified. The format to the RSSs and the 2010 specifications also allows us and requires that for every specification change in SSP, we have a home. The change in format was discussed earlier, and that's why we now have reserve specification sections in our standards. In the case when there isn't a reserve specification section available, then we use the RSS to create that new home for the special provisions. Now we're going to go and look at the special provisions specific for each project, which add only those requirements that are required because they're project specific. Standard special provisions are changes to the standard specifications or they can be changes to the RSSs. To understand how the special provision changes the standard specifications, you should first determine if there is an RSS. If there is an RSS for the standard, 
then life is simple because if there is no RSS, life is simple because you only need to look in two places in order to combine the specifications to get a common spec. If there is an RSS for a standard specification, then you need to look in three locations. You need to look at the 2010 standard specification, the revised standard specification, and the special provisions to make a correct interpretation of what the specification is. I know this sounds uh, complicated, but again, in the past with our 2006 standards, you were doing the same thing. You were taking the standard specs, the 2006 spec uh, amended to reads, and the special provision. But in that case, you didn't have the RAD method that would help you determine where to make the changes that were being made. The introductory clauses in our specifications allow us then to know exactly where we're changing the specs. Each specification, again, like we talked before, for special provisions has a home within the standards. And we will see some examples of this later in the presentation. Here's an example of RAD, and we're going to be looking at several of these. The, uh, the first example shows how paragraphs are replaced within a section of the specification. In both the revised standard specifications and special provisions, you will find the bold introduction text before every revision. Notice that the replace is based on a specific section of the specification, shown in our first example of section 19203B. The second example shows how a sentence can be replaced within a paragraph. The introduction has replaced the second sentence in the seventh paragraph of section 19304B, a 304 width. Again, a replace you can do, you can either replace a standard specification section, the entire section, with a, which you would see as a reserve section. You can replace a paragraph within a section. You can replace a range of paragraphs. You can replace a sentence. You can replace a word or a phrase, a short phrase or descriptive clause. And you can even replace an item in a, in a list, or you can replace an item that's within a table. The example shown here includes how the add and delete to, a standard, to the standard specifications. The add examples shown are based on adding to a section, and it is best when we add things to specifications that we use a, a generic add, which means you're just adding to the end of the section. So the two examples shown here have the introductory clause, which is an add. The first one is just add to section 19203G. A specific location example would be that you would be adding to the section say between paragraphs three and four would be included in the introductory clause. With an add, you can add a paragraph. You can add a paragraph to a specific location within a specification. You can add a sentence. You can add an item to a list, or you can add an item into a table. Delete is simple. Using delete is what contractors like. In this case, you can either delete a sentence, a section, a paragraph, or an item from a list. Now we'll move on here to show some examples of, of, of RAD within our existing standard specifications. Shown here is the revised standard specification for section 49 piling that was in our current posting. The first revision here shown replaces just the word sets is replaced with copies in section 49101C2. The second section example is the word set is replaced by copy in section 49101C2. The third revision shown in this thing is replacing a short clause within the fifth paragraph in section 49.101.D.2. And the last revision shown on this example is adding dispose of drill cuttings under section 19.203.B to the section 49.103. Again, you can see using the introductory clauses, we're very specific where changes now are being made within our specifications. The next example here is an example of how add is used. Uh, the, in this case, what we're showing is the difficult pile driving locations in section 49103 of section 49. So when you have a project specific information that the specification writer must add and include this information, they use the standard special provision, they fill in the blanks and it's included in the special provision. The second example shown here is a replace that revises the RSS. Now, important here, this one is revising the revised standard spec in section 391.11b1 by replacing the second, third, and fourth paragraphs 
and it also deletes Section 39101B2 of the RSS. This special provision is included when HMA paving and adjacent lanes must be within 5 to 10 feet at the end of every work shift. The lease portion of this RSS is basically making that the contractor cannot use the tapered notch wedge provision as part of the contract. I'm sure we all know how to count. The counting of paragraphs and what constitutes a paragraph is very important when we use this RAD method in the 2010 specifications. Let's start by looking at section 19303K, ground anchor and soil nail walls on page 271 of the standard specification. The numbers on the left side show how paragraphs are numbered. Notice that when a list is used, the list is not a separate paragraph. Be aware that adding or deleting paragraphs does not change the paragraph num numbering of the standard specifications. Under organization and the revised standard specifications, it states, any paragraph added or deleted by a revision clause does not change the paragraph numbering of the standard specifications for any other reference to a paragraph of the standard specifications. So when there are multiple changes being made, through either RSSs or through SSPs within a section, you do not renumber the paragraphs after the first addition or deletion is made. The paragraph numbers remain the same. And the second thing here is for our standard specification paragraph numbers when special provisions are used are treated the same way as with our revised standard specification. Under organizations and the instructions of the special provisions, it states the same kind of statement. Any paragraph added or deleted by a revision clause does not change the paragraph numbering of the standard specifications for any other reference to a paragraph of the standard specifications. Now for an example of paragraph numbering when an RSS is inserted. Shown is a standard specification for 19303K ground anchors and soil nail walls. Now the paragraph numbers are shown in blue on the left. The RSS for section 19303K includes an ad. If it's now shown in the proper location that we put into the RSS, notice that when we add this in there that the paragraph numbers have not changed for the revised standard spec. Okay, again shown, and this is the remainder of, of standard specification 1903K ground anchors and soil nail walls starting at paragraph seven. The RSS for section 19303K includes an add and replace for the ninth paragraph. So here we go with the animation. There you go. We've now inserted the uh, revised paragraph. Again, the paragraph numbers haven't changed with the added paragraph, and paragraph 9 has just been replaced. Moving on, again, shown is a portion of, of the standard specification 19303K ground anchors and soil nail walls and the RSS inserted. Again, the added paragraph isn't numbered and paragraph nine has been replaced. Now we have for this a SSP that needs to be inserted in the proper location. And so we're gonna do that now. Now you can see that the special provisions has been inserted where it belongs in the standard specification, section 19303K for ground anchors and soil nail walls. All we did is replace the item in the list. Okay, moving on here, we have sections 15505C construction on page 5, 235 and section 15 existing facilities shown on standard specs. Paragraph numbers are shown in blue on the left-hand side. For this, this section, there's RSS that deletes the par fourth paragraph. We're now gonna move that into the right position here. And you can see what happens is that it's deleted paragraph four, but the paragraph numbers have remained the same. This uh, specification also has another RSS. Uh, that replaces paragraph six, so we'll move that into position. Again, you can see that the original paragraph four we deleted is still paragraph four. We've replaced paragraph six, and it replaced paragraph six directly. 
Now we're going to look at some examples of what we do with embedded tables. Shown here is an example of specification with a table in section 13702B rock. Here are the paragraph numbers. If you notice, even with the tables and the list involved here, there are only two paragraphs for this specification. So embedded tables are not counted as separate paragraphs. The rule for tables is that they, sh they would not be counted, and in most cases, almost all tables within the standard specification are embedded tables. You can see from the second uh, number two paragraph, we have a list in the table. Again, embedded table within a list is treated the same way. There's no separate paragraph numbers. The simple rule to remember is that for both list and table, that they are not counted as separate paragraph numbers. Now that we've uh, completed it and you are experts at counting paragraphs in the RAD method, we're going to move on to an example here. This is going to be an open book test. The question is, how is thermoplastic traffic stripe payment determined? To answer this question, you must review the three documents, the special provision, the standard specifications, and the revised standard specifications. Because this is open book again, we've provided you the answers, but we're going to go through them now in, the, in this webinar. For this problem, we're going to start by looking at the standard specification. Standard specification section 19103, scope of payment on pages 112 and 113 of the, of the standard specifications provides just general information about the scope of payment. The most applicable paragraph within that section for this is it is the full compensation for all work involved in each bid item specified by the description and measurement unit shown on the bid item list. For the price of each bid item, number two, shown on the bid item list, were changed by contractor or the specified price adjustment. So from the section 9103 payment section, the only thing we see here is if we looked at the previous slide would be that the measurement for this is by the linear fee. The second place we're going to look is the 2010 standard specification, section 84, traffic stripes and payment marking, 84104 payment, that specifies that traffic stripe is measured along the line of traffic stripe without deductions for gaps in the broken traffic stripe. Third place to check is the 2010 specification, section 84204 payment, which states a double thermoplastic traffic stripe consisting of two four-inch yellow stripes is measured as two traffic stripes. The fourth place to check is the revised standard specifications, which has a revision for section 84204. It is specified that a double extruded thermoplastic traffic stripe is paid as two traffic stripes, while a double sprayable thermoplastic traffic stripe is measured as one traffic stripe. The last place you must check is the special provisions under Section 84, and at this time, there is no Section 82-4-2 special provision, so there's no additional measurement or payment information there. Now for the answer to our classroom problem, how is thermoplastic traffic strike payment determined? The answer is for the first item, 84-504, the payment would be based on the measured length without deductions for gaps and broken traffic stripe, and for the second paid item shown is 840560 thermoplastic stripe sprayable. Payment would be based on the measurement length without deductions for gaps and broken traffic stripe for both a four inch and for a double thermoplastic traffic stripe. I guess you'd have to be lucky to get excrutable in order to get measured twice in length. You would not know that again within going through the, the four different documents to make sure that you and then, this example really points out that as for any specification interpretation now or question, you really must be looking at the specifications in their entirety. You need to be aware of the 2010 standard specifications, division one, our general provisions, sections one through nine. You need to be looking at the 2010 specifications technical section involved. In this case, it would be section 84 that we looked at. You also need to be looking at if there is a subsection in the, which there normally is, of the technical content section. So in this case, it was section 84-2. 
And then you need to check to make sure there isn't any revision to the revised standard specifications for those sections involved. And last, you need to make sure you're checking your contract special provisions to see there isn't a project specific specification. So this concludes the formal 2010 contract construction standards presentation, and we're now ready to begin our question and answer session. We encourage you to participate by asking questions using the Q&A module on the right side of your computer screen. There may not be adequate time to answer all questions received during this webinar. We're documenting all your questions received. For those questions that are not addressed during the webinar because there's not adequate time or because we need to do additional research in order to answer the question, we will be posting these questions and answers on the Division of Construction webpage. So let's begin with the first question now. The first question, uh, technical question that was asked is the location of many specifications in the 2010 standard specifications are quite different than in the previous version. It can be difficult for new users to locate specs that have moved. Why was a more detailed table of contents not included in the 2010 standard specifications books? Jill? Um, we did do a research on um, having the headings in the book. It became quite extensive for the table of contents, so it would have been about almost 40 pages long if we included every heading. Um, so with that decision, we decided because it was it was so long, um, we chose just to have the main headings for every um, division. We also have in the back an index, and we tried to index a lot of the topics. And, and we've had the index in our prior version, so we just maintained that. Okay. The second question we have is. When can we expect Caltrans to post an updated electronic standard specification, including the revised standard specification? The volume of changes is already cumbersome. And I'll go ahead and take the lead on answering that one. Caltrans is working with industry now. We have a joint task force to look at our specifications and process. This is one of the items that that group is going to be addressing over the next few months and coming up with a decision document of the various ways we can handle future changes with specifications. Uh, we, we understand the, the cumbersome of that. Actually, right now, we're at 285 pages through our revised standard specs. The good news is that we aren't making any changes right now for the next year because we are in the process of putting together our 2015 edition of the standard specifications that will include all of those RSSs to date and other special provisions that are ready to be moved into the standards. So again, as we're, we're in the future, within the next year, you'll see another version of the specs come out that everything will be in one volume and should be easier to use. Okay, the next question here, why are there revised standard specs? I guess we can answer that first. Um, our subject matter experts in the department make changes to the standards. That's why we maintain um, and post the most current technical specifications. And because we have a published book, the changes need to go in the revisions, which is called the RSS. Uh, the next part of that question is, we need to revise standard specs more frequently than four to six years between standard spec books. Jill? It, it becomes a time and resource issue if we published standards more frequently than that, or it would become a living document and there would be no published book. So uh, that's kind of the struggle we have. Uh, the changes happen, we implement because there have been negotiations with both the department and um, the externals. So once technical changes are approved, we need to start implementing them in our contracts. And that's the method to implement. Okay, the next question is, CSI. What does this stand for again? Um, CSI stands for Construction Specifications Institute. And it's mainly for building construction, although there's different cities and I think a state that uses it for their specifications. Next question is, 
how to find the owner of section 19-6 and 19-7. Um, internally, our technical experts are designated in the department. That is something that we don't have available for externals. If you'd like to contact me and you need some information, I'm available uh, by email so you can you can ask me and I'll be happy to try and connect you with the technical owner. Just send those my way, Chuck Susco. I think I'm the owner of those two sections. Okay, the next question. Since the RSSs and some SSPs reference specific paragraph numbers, why aren't paragraph numbers included in the 2010 standard specification book on the left side of the paragraph? Jill? Um, the document is quite large. We did work with our publications, our state publications. Unfortunately, their software does not number paragraphs, nor do they number lines. It would have to be done by hand. Um, and that's something we've tried to look into the 2015s. That's also the same case with state publications um, because I have to use them to publish the documents. They have that constraint and therefore it constrains me. And if we do something like that, it would be a hand numbering system. Okay, the next question here. On the Caltrans website, is there a SSP that has the RSS already inserted? I'm going to answer it as no, I'm, and I'm not sure I understand the question, but the RSS are the revisions to the standard specifications. And SSP is project specific, so they're special um, standard specifications. Um, so they get edited on a project specific basis versus an RSS are changes made to the standards. So there, there are two different documents and there's two different uses for those documents. Next question is, submittal and shop drawings are supposed to be submitted 15 days and 20 days respectively. Are these business days or calendar days? Uh, these are calendar days and if you go to page 8 of your standard specifications, you'll see um, the definition of a day and a day is 24 consecutive hours running from midnight to midnight, and it's a calendar day. The term um, working day is only used to measure um, the time within a day to count whether a day counted as a day. And then business day, we try to use that when we want to say that three business days, but we don't expect the weekend to count. So, and that's um, kind of an industry term, I don't know, industry term that we've picked up. So the definition for a business day is a day on the calendar except for Saturday or a holiday, and Sunday is a holiday. The next question is, is there a federal mandate to use the 2010 standard specs for federal projects? I'm not aware of any federal mandate. It's been a department's decision when to implement the 2010. Next question, where do plaques fit in the ranking of contract parts, section 5102? They're part of the contract. They're part of the special provisions because we have to put those requirements in there. They're just located in the information handout. I might need more clarity, but part of it is that when the contractor signs off on his bid, He's acknowledging that the plaques are part of the contract. Okay, next question. Bid item and bid item list is defined bid items is not. Definition is unclear and may be interpreted as specific item of work or the various list items of bid items. We'll give you a written response to that one. And actually, if you could... Um maybe clarify where this question is coming from, maybe in the standards, that would also help. Next question. It would be very helpful if a smaller version of the 2010 standard specification books were available for purchase for use in the field. Why isn't this offered by Caltrans Publications Unit? The decision was made to go to a full-size book versus half-size. If we did go to a half size book, the thickness of the book would be twice as thick. So 
I'm sure that would be cumbersome out in the field to handle. Okay, the next question here is uh, when will the next RSS be issued? And I'm waiting for that answer too. Wow, I didn't know people wanted more changes. Um, hopefully not in the near future, um, but I am collecting a laundry list of changes and that has to get elevated to determine whether or not there will be an additional RSS posted prior to the 2015s coming out. Um, because my office is working on uh, developing the 2015s currently. Okay, and the next question is, is it safe to say that the 2015 standard specifications will look very similar to the 2010 standard specifications? Yes, we're not going backwards, we're moving forward with that organization. You will probably see um, additional sections that have been reserved now have um, other technical sections in there. Um, but yes, we're keeping the same organization. So you will see the four part four part format and um, you will see the descriptions of the sections and their divisions. Okay, the next question is, if a SP special provision comes out in a bid in February and the RSS is updated in July, does the SP still override the RSS? Um, it would be based on the RSS included in your notice to bidders and special provisions. So if we update an RSS, unless it's done by a change order or it's done as an addendum, the existing RSS in the in the contract documents would um, would comply. You'd have to use those. The next question here: Are the revised standard specifications the same as the amendments to the standard specifications included within the special provisions located at the end of the special provision? Again, I think what you're saying here is in the 2006, what we had was the amended to read, which were located at the end of the uh, 2006 special provision, and you're 100% correct. The revised standard specification really just replaces that same amended to read in the 2010. The next question here, is there any feedback available about the 2010 standards from projects currently under construction and using the 2010 standards? Uh, the feedback that we have gotten from Caltrans is one is that the uh, AGC actually came to us and said there were some issues with the 2010 implementation and that's why we formed the task group and we've been working with them on the issues that they've brought forward. Uh, numerous issues they brought forward were already revised in our RSSs and so yeah there's been some issues but again it's not a long list of issues and it, whenever those are brought to our attention what we do is we look at it and see if we need to make any revision or if it's just something like this that we need to get training out there so that everyone knows how the, the specifications go together. Okay, the next one here is without payment clauses for each section, how does the contractor get paid for items of work that are not included in bid items and are not covered under sections 1, 2, and 10? Well, the, the bid item, the first two digits of the bid item in your bid item list would set forth the section that applies. So if there's no bid item for that work and it doesn't fall in, in section or in divisions one, two, or ten, then that should be a question that should be asked during the bidding. Okay, the next one. Next question. Why was all Sundays considered a holiday, but it's not a typical holiday like Christmas? Well, the law defines Sunday as a holiday, and I believe it's in Government Code 6700. I think that's where it's at. Um, but it clearly defines that it's Sunday is a holiday. And from construction's viewpoint, what happened is because the Government Code defines Sunday as a holiday, and then we had a job that said the contractor had to work seven days a week except holidays. There was confusion of whether Sunday was a holiday or not. So we, we figured we better make this very clear. It's also on page nine in the definitions for holiday. Okay, the next question. Has calendar days been eliminated from the contract as opposed to working days? Jill? 
No, absolutely not. On page eight, again, um, Ruth had previously answered something regarding days. There is a definition for days, as well as a definition for business day and working day. So depending on the project and the requirements of what a, a document, some sort of thing that triggers a time, um, it has to specify whether it's a working day, a business day, or just a day. Um, so those are defined on page eight in the standard specification. We've had several requests that uh, will the PowerPoint be posted, and yes, the PowerPoint for this presentation will be posted, and also the questions. So, okay, the next question here: Why doesn't Caltrans prepare a clear, concise document for each bid, including the RAD, that may be used by all contractors? Having each contractor prepare their own documents presents problems including different interpretations of the work, payment method, and method of payment, etc. Well, again, as, as, as I know in some other agencies, they have what they call a conform copy where they take their standards, they take their special provisions, they create one document. Again, as we have an industry group that's working with us at this time, since Caltrans is not all electronic, it would be very hard for us to move in that direction that we have a conform copy for every contract. Uh, where you have one set of, of, of standards that have been conformed that only have the standard special provisions and revised standards that go for that project. But again, that's something we'll be discussing with our industry partners as part of our ongoing uh, efforts in this area. And once we all get to a place where we all have electronic devices that we can implement something like that, it may be something in the future that happens. Okay, next question here. Is it just Caltrans staff that write the standard specifications, or is the construction industry also included in the development of the new spec book? This may eliminate so many RSSs. Um, changes come through me by the technical expert in the department. That technical expert may or may not work with their industry partners. They may have some other partners both internally within Caltrans or maybe local agencies that they work with. Um, but again, they're deemed the department experts, so if there's changes made, um, that's how I process them and, and post them and making them available for everybody to use. So if you're questioning why so many changes, I, I think that needs to go back to um, the subject matter experts asking why they need to make these changes. Um, there are some agreements that are being made that are, are beyond our control. Well, I think that concludes our question and answer session from the presenters here. We thank you for participating and your interest in our specifications and improvements.